Hello, and welcome to tonight's Red Bull R18 webinar. Uh, my name is Nathan Winkelstein. I am the Associate Artistic Director of Red Bull Theater. I am beaming in from Lenape Land, also known as Harlem, New York. Welcome to our panel discussion, The Closet or the Stage? A conversation about Margaret Cavendish's The Convent of Pleasure, presented in partnership with the R18 Collective and the Center for Arts and Society at Carnegie Mellon. We will be producing an online reading of the Convent of Pleasure a week from today on Monday the 14th. I hope you all can join us for that. And I am thrilled, without further ado, to introduce our panelists tonight from uh, many different universities. We have Misty G. Anderson, who is the James R. Cox Professor and Head of English at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. We have Liza Blake, who is the Associate Professor of English at the University of Toronto. Julie Crawford, who is the Mark Van Doren Professor of Humanities in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. And finally, Christina Straub is Professor Emeritus of English at Carnegie Mellon University. And so many other credits, but that was already so many. Thank you all for joining. It's so exciting to have such a wonderful group of experts on this subject in the space at one time, and I can't wait for tonight's um, for tonight's discussion. Um, so for all of you watching here on the webinar with us, this is about half an hour of presentation and then about half an hour of Q&A. For the Q&A aspect of the evening, if you look on the bottom of your screen, you will see both a chat function, which we're all using very li lively right now, um, but but please do not use for questions that you wish uh, the panelists to answer. Please instead use the Q&A function, which you should also see along the bottom of the screen. The way that Q&A function works is that you cannot see the other questions being asked. This means two things. First of all, don't think you're shouting into a void. Second of all, don't assume that everybody else is asking really interesting questions and you shouldn't ask questions. So just find that nice, happy middle ground where you ask any question you want to ask. That would be great. Um, any questions that occur to you during the presentation, please do put them in there and the panelists will answer them once they get to the Q&A section in the second half. I think that that is all of the intro we need to jump into this convo. Um, so thank you all for showing us your faces. I know four of us are about to disappear um, while Liza takes us away first. Liza, it is all yours. And Liza, you're muted. You would think after two years, I would know better. Um, so thank you to Red Bull Theater for hosting this conversation um, and to all of you for coming. I'm interested in thinking in my sort of 10 minute presentation today about the idea of the closet in the closet drama. Um, and in particular, think, right, thinking about how many people are in that closet. Um, when we talk about closet drama, what we mean is a play that was written to be performed, not to be performed, but to be read. Um, and I want to think today about what is um, gained by Cavendish's decisions to publish her plays rather than having them act for the public stage. Um, obviously, a lot is to get, be gained by having them performed, but also I think there's some things interesting about print that I'd like to think about as well. So when we think about the closet of closet drama, we tend to think about this kind of image, right? Um, this engraving of Cavendish alone in her study, which she had made to insert into certain of her printed books, studious as the bottom poem insists, um, but also all alone, a sort of solitary thing to write plays that are not meant to be performed. But in fact, her printed books, and in particular, um, her own printed books, were really social objects for Cavendish, one of the chief vehicles by which she maintained attachment to the people and the institutions that mattered most to her. 
So throughout her life, she donated her books widely, um, distributing them to her friends and to institutions, to universities, including giving stacks of books to every single college in Oxford and in Cambridge universities that existed during her lifetime. And here you can see donor inscriptions from four different Cambridge copies of her Convent of Pleasure of the second volume of plays, which is where the Convent of Pleasure is printed, um, where the colleges have noted that they received the book from Cavendish herself. We also know that in addition to being sort of social objects, she took her printed books very seriously and she really valued them as objects. So after the books had been printed, but before she gave them out, she would regularly intervene in her own text, sometimes making notes in her own hand, sometimes having a secretary correct errors before they went out, which is what you can see at the bottom of the slide here. Um, and sometimes, as in many plays from the second volume of plays, including The Convent of Pleasure, having these paper slides lips pasted in that mark out certain scenes as having been written by her husband. Now, interestingly, these paper slips uh, are present in only about half of the copies I've looked at. So I've looked at maybe 30 uh, copies of the second volume of plays, and only half of them have these, um, have these scenes marked out. But I want to highlight about these sort of printed slips, and here in Dry on a really great article by Jeffrey Meston, that in those copies that did get slips, it helps us think a little bit differently about Cavendish's authorship, and as well about the sort of community or the communal nature of writing um, in Cavendish's household, where she and, her Cavendish, she and her husband, William, are regularly collaborating together, regularly writing together. And so if print is a closet, um, if the sort of printed book is a kind of solitary closet, then there are at least two people in that closet together, um, and four people if you count the secretary who's making the uniform corrections, as well as the printer who sort of Xerox those paper slips for them. And I think thinking about, um, if we're thinking about what print makes possible that performance on the stage would not, um, marking out the, the play as a collaborative object is something that's much more easily um, visible in the printed version than in the stage version. So in her first volume of plays, she paints a picture of sort of doubly collaborative authorship. So not only did William add multiple scenes to multiple plays, but she also says that she only started writing plays in the first place after her husband read his plays aloud to her. So in this prefatory letter, which is from the first volume, um, and which I will say is one of many prefatory letters in this volume, um, she also explains in some detail, quote, why she chose to send her plays forth to be printed rather than keeping them concealed in hopes to have them first acted. So though this explanation begins from a place of modesty, right, she says your plays husband are lively and mine are dead and so they deserve to be read not staged, um, it develops into something more interesting as you move throughout the prefatory letters. So, for example, in the next of the several prefatory letters addressed to the readers, she lays out, quote, the reason why I put out my plays in print before they are acted, unquote. Um, and she gives three reasons for this, right? So reason one is that she writes in English, and the theaters in England had been closed for so long because of the English Civil Wars that she just doesn't think there's enough talent trained up to really perform them. Uh, reason number two is that her plays are too long and she can't bring herself to cut them. Um, and so uh, if you read them, you can read them on your own time and you won't feel impolite if you get up in the middle of a show because you're bored. And reason three, she states that once a play is printed, there's less desire to see it performed. And so she has sort of committed herself to delighting readers rather than delighting spectators. In the letters that follow, she then explores um, not just sort of the reasons that she decided on print, but also I think some of the benefits um, of going to print rather than the stage. So for example, because she's not putting her plays out to the broadest possible audience, she argues she's able to do things with her drama that those catering to a broader audience might not be able to. She tells her readers that her plays offer a new kind of drama, one that's different from quote, such have been writ in former days, chiefly because she doesn't borrow plots like those other playwrights. That Shakespeare, what a hack, just stealing stories from everyone else. Now note that all the playwrights listed here are all playwrights who had their plays printed in folio in the 17th century, which is also the, the sort of large format where her plays are printed. Um, so she's putting herself in good print company as well as good dramatic company here. 
She tells us as well in these letters that her plays often deliberately flaunt the dramatic unities that would be so fiercely argued for by John Dryden four years later in his essay on dramatic poesy. She refuses to confine the action to one day's time, which is the, the dramatic unity of time, nor does she interplay with all the characters coming in a flock together on the stage, a gesture I think to the dramatic unity of action, which knits together plots and subplots in a final culminating scene. Now this rejection of unities is not merely aesthetic, but stems as well from her philosophy of nature and of what is natural. Her plays are not neat, she argues here, because nature is not neat. And this means, and this is honestly one of my favorite things about Cavendish's plays, that sometimes she will have plots and subplots that literally never come together or have any relationship to one another. There will be one set of characters doing one thing, another set of characters doing another thing, and you just alternate between the two of them and then the play ends. Um, it's really fabulous. Um, doing this, writing this kind of drama, because why would you assume that these people will necessarily meet these other people in real life, um, especially if they are of different social classes? She insists that this is a natural way of writing, mirroring, quote, the natural course of all things in the world. Now, Cavendish's Convent of Pleasure is printed in Cavendish's second volume of plays, which came out in 1668. Nevertheless, many of the thoughts about dramatic form that we see in the prefatory letters of the first volume um, are still clearly motivating her writing in the second volume as well. And Convent, like many of the plays in the first volume, uh, likewise shows many experiments with dramatic form. So I provided on this slide just a brief inventory of many of the things that Convent of Pleasure includes that are not really dramatic dramatic action that don't advance the plot and in fact that sort of pause the forward motion of the plot and the main characters. Um, and you will notice that there's one in every scene. There are all these moments where suddenly you stop following the story of the main character and you have something else instead. Now it's possible to pick any one of these sort of interpolations, these sort of non-action uh, um, scenes, um, and ask about, uh, use them to sort of read the rest of the play, right? Um, and in fact, this is what I do when I teach the play. I ask my students how the philosophy of nature and natural pleasures um, sort of structures the way that the rest of the play imagines pleasure. Or in other classes, we might close read those little micro scenes on how marriage is universal universally miserable, and then use that to think as a sort of interpretation of the marriage with what the play ends. But these sort of anti-action scenes, which are peppered throughout the entire play, um, I think really make it impossible to think about what this play is doing, to sort of ask what this play is accomplishing, um, without really grappling with the fact that what Convent of Pleasure is, is a, dra is a drama that is sort of um, opposed to dramatic action in a lot of ways. Interestingly, despite her flaunting of dramatic action throughout the Convent of Pleasure, Cavendish did seem to imagine the convent as something that could or would be performed, as indeed it is today, um, and again, as it will be a week from today. So Mimic's epilogue addresses not only readers, but also noble spectators by candlelight, um, imagining with candlelight either an indoor private theater as opposed to the public stage like the globe, or a more intimate space of a household, or perhaps even the courts. Um, he also conjures imagined applause that might follow the performance. Um, and I will note that neither of these are um, uh, necessarily indicated a performance, right? Because you can read by candlelight just as you can um, watch by candlelight. Um, but nevertheless, it does seem to sort of conjure performance um, despite the fact that there's dramatic action. So finally, I want to stop talking now to make room for my other panelists, but I'll just end by proposing that Cavendish's printed plays invite us to rethink both dramatic action and the acting that supposedly might take her drama out of the closet. So she did write closet drama, but as I've tried to suggest today, um, that when we imagine Cavendish's closet, maybe we shouldn't picture something like this, a sort of lonely woman alone in her study, uh, but instead something like this, which is an engraving that she had made for another one of her books, um, a sort of family space, still enclosed, um, but much more crowded and much more sort of busy than we typically allow or imagine. And with that, I will end and turn things over to Julie Crawford. Thanks so much, Liza, that was great. Hi, everybody. Um, 
I'm going to share screen two for an uncharacteristic PowerPoint. Um, so I'm going to talk about the comments and pleasures in the title, those two things, not the paradox, because Cavendish is really clear on that paradox that her convent is not a pleasure to vex the senses, but rather to please them, but rather you know, why the location, why the convent, and why the kinds of pleasures that are in it. So first to the convents. Um, I'll just speed through. There's a Henrietta Maria and Charles I. So that was the king and, and queen that uh, Cavendish was in exile with. There she is with her husband. <laughs> um, you can't tell in there, but he was a lot older than she was. Um, so first to the convents, there, I'm going to talk about sort of three convents that I think haunt the convent of pleasure. I'll talk about them really quickly. Um, the first is sort of evoked in this image, which is from um, a civil war battle, which was St. John's Abbey, um, which was the Lucas family home. So Margaret Lucas before Cavendish, um, that was her name. And it was sort of bombed and ransacked and burned during the English civil wars. Um, and her brother, Charles Lucas, was executed in 1648. So there's sort of a long story of convents and monasteries that under Henry VIII, they'd been taken over and given to the elite as sort of favors um, and turned into pleasure palaces, really. Um, but during the Civil War, many of them, including St. John's Abbey and Welbeck Abbey, which is the next one I'm going to talk about, which was the Cavendish um, property, were turned into garrisons during the war and were ransacked and destroyed. So this one, as you can see, you can see a little head. If you're interested, you can see the little head um, and the fire. Um, and for those who've looked at the play, there's a scene when the men trying to get into the Convent of Pleasure talk about firebombing it. Um, so here's the next one. This is Welbeck Abbey. This is from William Cavendish's book on dressage, on horsemanship, and there's Welbeck Abbey in the, in the background. Um, so when you think about the convents that she was thinking about and what Liza was saying about these sort of convents, um, these kinds of places in which the plays were read or performed, this is what we're looking at. Here it is in 2007, a little tiny pile. Um, two things about Welbeck Abbey. Um, I already said it was a garrison. William Cavendish put on performances there for the king as this sort of way of sort of petitioning and advising the king as well as sort of showing his largesse. Um, in 1651, Margaret Cavendish compounded at Goldsmiths Hall for her share of the estates. Women were allowed to get claim one fifth of estates that were sequestered. And she was denied because she married him after he was already a delinquent. Um, so, you know, she didn't get any of that. Um, the other interesting thing about Welbeck is it was defended by William Cavendish's daughter, um, partially defended by her during the English Civil Wars. Her name is Jane Cavendish. I'll talk about her in a minute. Um, Liza already alluded to her in the family frontispiece that we saw where they're all sitting together. Um, the next one is a convent <laughs> that Henry, M Henrietta Maria or Mariah founded in Chaillot, France in 1651, the same year Mark Cavendish was compounding for her property rights. It had been a pleasure palace of Catherine de' Medici. And so it was already associated with certain types of pleasures. And but people saw Henrietta Maria's sort of establishment of a convent um, and sort of decamping there as kind of a betrayal. Um, and what was she doing spending all this money taking over a pleasure palace um, when there were all of these um, suffering people? Um, other interesting thing about there, that is that Margaret Cavendish, I might have said this already, had been in exile with Henrietta Maria in France from 1643 to 1645. So my sort of argument is that they haunt um, the play in all kinds of ways. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of those ways. One way is that when the men are sort of petitioning to get into the convent and imagine firebombing it, I see both of these as sort of ways that the play is thinking about what had happened to these royalist estates, particularly Welbeck Abbey um, during the war. The second thing is when Lady Happy retreats, she talks about going to a place where you can feel like a monarch, but not have any of the cares that wait upon royalty. And um, that's, you know, 
absolutely what sort of these royalist retreats to these estates were about. Um, I already mentioned the entertainments, the country asset entertainments that were put on at these estates, particularly Welbeck. Ben Johnson was commissioned by Cavendish to put on several performances there. Um, and also sort of citation of court performances of the court of Henrietta Maria, where she herself cross-dressed in male roles. She also um, class cross-dressed as a citizen wife. She was a nymph. She was a shepherdess. Um, she was a shepherd. Um, there was a whole sort of culture of what they call platonic love. There's an amazing scene in the play where the, the ladies are seen kissing with more alacrity than ladies normally do. And this is sort of a joke about the cult of platonic love. But the last thing I want to talk about that I think is really important is the sort of pleasures and the material luxuries that um, I was made so much of in the play. So I'm going to go down a bit. I'll talk about that one in a minute. Um, I could talk about those too. But the material luxuries that I want to talk about are sort of listed here. There's what it's one of these sort of takeout scenes that Liza alluded to, where we're just sort of going through material pleasures. Um, and the point that I want to make is that that list, right, furniture, beddings, parks, really lines up with the list of things that Margaret Cavendish listed as stolen or destroyed from Wellback Abbey in her life of her husband which was kind of a text that was sort of pleading for um, reparations. So she does this accounting in her life of, um, her, of her husband um, in which she sort of talks about um, what they suffered both during the wars, all the money they spent supporting him and that money was not forthcoming, right? When in, in 1668, when the play was put on, the Cavendish is waiting for a long time to be paid back for all the money that her husband put into the war. So Eliza talked a little bit about the entertainments within the play. In addition to the sort of why marriages, I think Liza said, terrible for everybody, um, there was a pastoral and there was sort of a sea nymph scene. And these were both very um, citational of Henry and Mariah's court culture. Um, but the... Uh, the other thing that I think is really important about this sort of plea for um, or this sort of celebration of this material plenty is that Cavendish was very much thinking about Welbeck Abbey in particular. So I'm going to go back up to these slides. So this is the slide that um, uh, Liza showed you already. Um, and so it's Margaret Cavendish and William Cavendish on the far right here. They were in Antwerp, actually actually when this was published and and so his playwriting daughters and their husbands and various people um they weren't actually together so this is sort of a fantasy um and in the she talks below about in the semicircle where they sit telling tales of pleasure and of wit so like Liza said it's sort of this coterie environment and but the part I'm interested in here to add to what Liza was saying is here you may read without a sin or crime so it's the idea of sort of signaling that what was going on in this coterie or this closet or this country house or this convent of people gathering together with like interests was something that was sort of politically supercharged. And so if we look below, we can see, the, I love this part of the engraving. This is one of the, the women gathered with her hand in the fire. Stuff is hot, right? And partly this is citation of the Cavalier winter when the Royalists had to sort of submerge their hopes and wait it out to return to Royalist glory. But it's also talking about the sort of heat of what was going on in these garrisons and in these convents. And here you see Margaret have Cavendish's personal attendant, John Proctor, opening the window, right? And is it is he letting in fresh air or is he sort of conscious of who might be spying and listening to them outside? Right, so there were, Marta Strasnick, you show that there were 90 um, sort of closet plays published during this, this period and that the closet plays that were sort of meant to be read and performed within sort of um, communities and often communities of resistance and critique were super politically charged. Um, I wanted to talk about just one other thing. So Liza already mentioned the council slips, but in the, in, not the cancel slips, but where she indicates here that her husband was writing with her. And in both of the scenes, and these are actually taken from uh, Liza's Digital Cavendish site, 
But here is one where they're talking about sheep hooks and oaten pipes and pastoral ornaments. And here's one where they're talking about jolly wassail and, and syllabubs. And all of these terms that are so not familiar to us were um, terms, you know, they were kinds of rural and uh, sort of merry old England entertainments and um, ways of, of living, which were sort of associated with royalist um, resistance to the austerities of the Puritans and to them sort of being frozen out. And so keeping all of these ideas alive um, was a way of sort of keeping their way of life alive and signaling their ambition. So there's lots of things more to talk about that we can talk about in the, um, the Q&A, but I just wanna show one last slide in my last second, which is this was Holmby House, which is alluded to in the play. <laughs> And basically, Mark, uh, William Cavendish has this interpolated um, song around a maypole um, where he says, look, what you're going to get here, um, the lyrics say what you're going to get here isn't what you get at Holmby House. And Holmby House was where Charles I was sort of kept prisoner by um, Parliament. So I'm going to stop sharing and um, turn my face off and turn it over to Misty Anderson. Thanks. Julia, that was just fantastic. It's such an honor to be up here with you all. And this is also uh, a piece of the R18 Collective dream coming true because we really assembled in order to find ways to get more of the plays from uh, the restoration in the 18th century onto the stage. So this feels like uh, a really great start. Um, I'm gonna share with you just a, a couple of slides here um, and position Cavendish as an experimental writer. Uh, as, as Julie pointed out, you know, a lot of different genres, Eliza as well. Um, Cavendish published many more uh, volumes than this, but note how many of her writings have to do with either philosophical or physical opinions, which would have been intersections with the world of science. Um, the Royal Society, which Charles II established, is uh, a, a kind of a gathering of the scientific minds and begins to define um, an experimental culture in theaters um, in which different, uh, you know, different figures would come and perform experiments. And Cavendish famously, famously attended the Royal Society wearing a mix of men's and women's clothing. Um, so the, uh, the Convent of Pleasure, which comes out in plays never before printed, comes out the same year that she writes her science fiction novella, a description of the new world called The Blazing World. And that fascinating, fascinating novella um, takes up uh, a, a set of, of pseudoscientific questions and kind of travel literature blended together. But in it, and especially in The Convent of Pleasure, you see a lot of focus on tactility. Um, what is touch? What happens when we touch things? These questions are being framed by the scientific discoveries and inquiries of the mid 17th century, the first microscopes, uh, that are changing the way that people look at the material world. Um, but there are also uh, new theories of the nervous system that are beginning to take their shape. They won't properly for another 50 years at least. But this illustration is um, Descartes' illustration of how pain travels through the nerves up to the brain, right, giving us that Cartesian mind-body split. Cavendish, uh, who pushes back against that Cartesianism with what I like to think of as a kind of polymorphous intelligence, believes that our bodies know things. Um, she says, for I believe that the eye, ear, tongue, and all the body have knowledge as well as the mind. So it's a kind of um, the body keeps the score thinking about how knowledge is incarnated in us, is materialized and embodied um, throughout our bodies. Um, so out of this perspective on sensation, we can kind of, we see a connection with the way that she approaches gender, which includes a kind of hybridity. As Julie pointed out, a lot of those sort of cross-dressing moments in gender play have a context in the court mask, um, but there's also a, a, a pressing uh, of that boundary. Um, and she does that in uh, the blazing world, her novella, and note here that the Empress and the Lady, these two figures, wind up having a kind of platonic meetup in some uh, dematerialized plane, but 
uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about how they how they enter one another's bodies and that husbands have reasons to be jealous of platonic lovers. So there's some of that cheek that uh, Julie pointed out, but there's also once again, the spiritual kiss, the embrace. Um, now in the convent of pleasure, we have lavish, lavish descriptions of what the material world of the convent is going to look like the opposite um, of, a, of a convent of austerity. These are some of the images that we've, uh, we've used with the cast just to get them thinking about it. And here is again, that passage that I think we're all drawn to when she describes what the chambers are going to be like. Um, and they include a great looking glass in which we may view ourselves and take pleasure in our own beauties. Um, so that, uh, that kind of excess of pleasure becomes a bit of an argument. How do our bodies and how do our experiences of pleasure and sensation shape us? Now, Julie mentioned the court mask. And a couple of things that I would just add here is that um, many court masks uh, drew on classical rather than Christian allegory. Uh, that professional musicians and actors would be hired to take part in them, but the court members were also acting. And this is where women were on stage, even in the earlier 17th century. Um, so Cavendish brings that kind of memory of women on stage in the court mask to the beginning of the restoration where we do see women on professional stages. So lots of shepherds and shepherdesses um, and, uh, I, I, you know, again, an, a sort of epic interaction where the court is mirroring um, itself to itself. Now, when we get to the restoration, um, we see the reopening of public theaters, but they have to be reinvented because these theater spaces have been empty uh, for, um, for almost 12 years by the time they reopen. So those first stages were tennis courts, actually, provisional spaces for public performance. Pretty soon, the Kings and the Dukes companies get into a bit of an arms race once Drury Lane and Dorset Garden theaters open um, for more tech and for more seating capacity. Um, Cavendish would have seen by the time she wrote The Convent of Pleasure, the early versions of these theaters, they're beginning to be um, made more elaborate. Um, there's changeable scenery uh, in grooved slats where you could draw off a scene. So you could have multiple scenes and they would, the flats would, um, uh, would ride off on, onto the track and you could open to the next scene. There was some machinery um, as well. After the Great Fire of London in 1666, when, when both are, are functionally destroyed, uh, they get rebuilt with even more tech. And the image here from the Empress of Morocco is from a representation of a Dorset Garden production that would have been a little bit later, but you can start to see that the tech is getting elaborate. There was elaborate tech in the court mask as well. Inigo Jones, um, the mask of blackness had machines that made, made it look as though the sea was roiling. Uh, and so she's taking the memory of court mask in the present experience of restoration theater in this imaginative space. Um, but by far the biggest, uh, the biggest sort of experiment that she's a part of um, is seeing women playing women's roles. The first uh, that we know of is Margaret Hughes, who plays Desdemona. Um, so this is uh, written about by, uh, by Peeps. Um, but the, the early actresses also brought with them a little bit of a, um, a sort of stain of sexual scandal. Uh, Margaret Hughes was also the mistress of Prince Rupert, who had been a Civil War hero along with uh, William Cavendish. Uh, Nell Gwynn, of course, famously was Charles II's mistress. Um, and Elizabeth Barry was the mistress of John Wilmot II, Earl of Rochester. So there's a, um, this, that sexual scandal that continued to follow the actress is uh, something that Cavendish is negotiating. Um, and uh, in closing, I'll just note that uh, Anne Bracegirdle comes along a little bit later is so uh, shaped by that narrative and an anxiety about being identified um, as an actress who, uh, who is somehow um, sexually dangerous um, or, uh, or impure. Uh, that, and, and that association, of course, led many people to refer to actresses 
as prostitutes. Um, she goes out of her way to maintain her reputation as, uh, as an actress who is without scandal. She never marries, even though she's the object of a great deal of attention and even one abduction attempt. So that's a little bit of the sort of theatrical background that Cavendish after 1660 is experiencing. And um, I would argue that's shaping her, uh, her vision in the Convent of Pleasure, which we just can't wait to share with you next week. And now I will turn it over to my colleague, Christina Straub. Liza and Julie, I am learning a lot. Uh, from from this panel. I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, there we go. Uh, so I'm kind of picking up where Misty left off and taking a step back and thinking about this period we call the long 18th century. Because what happens um, in, from the early years of the 18th century well into the 19th century is that women playwrights uh, begin to have a very strong presence in the commercial theaters of uh, Britain uh, at the, uh, over the course of the century. So uh, my question is, you know, what happened that brought so many women out of the closet, as it were, uh, and into the commercial theater over this period? And I, I wanna, there's a lot of different factors, but I wanna talk about two uh, main sort of historical trends. Uh, the first one, is the rise of the woman writer, as it's uh, famously been caused, called by Jane Spencer. Um, and basically, um, this the, the uh, proliferation of women playwrights really is part of a larger proliferation of women writers, um, which is due to several different things. First of all, beginning in the 18th century, there's growing support for the education of women that support for the education of women is really part of a larger kind of um, social agenda uh, in uh, Britain at the time, which is to think about the need to educate the public more generally than had been thought necessary in the past. Representative government is kind of just a gleam in the eye, in the political eye of Britain at the moment. Uh, and women are certainly not voting or anything like that. But it's beginning to, uh, be, people are beginning to think that it's important that women are educated uh, for the influence that they have on their families. So as a result, the fastest rising literacy rate in the first half of the 18th century is among middle class women. Second highest, by the way, is servants, which is another topic. Uh, but in any case, you do have women who are increased, larger numbers of women who are, are capable of reading and writing at a very sophisticated level. At the same time, you have a relative scarcity of economic opportunities for those educated middle class women. Uh, there are not too many ways outside of marriage that these women can support themselves and make a living. So what you see over the course of the century is the sort of slow emergence of writing as a respectable income source uh, for women. The other trend that I want to shine a little spotlight on um, that, that is equally responsible for the um, number of women playwrights uh, who are successful on the London stage is um, the expanding business of theater and the expanding business of print. Um, that publication after the Licensing Act expires um, at the end of the 17th century. Um, publishing becomes a good way to make money. Writing becomes a good way to make money. Um, and women are certainly on that train. Theaters also um, grow exponentially over the course of the 18th century. This is an image of the Royal Theater at Drury Lane from 1794. It's a house that seats over 3,500 audience members. And if you compare that to the Royal Theater at Drury Lane in 1663, it only sat 700. So theater becomes, um, you can almost think about it in terms of an embodied social media of the 18th century. A lot of people are involved in it. The houses are fully lit. There's a ton of social interaction as well as a play going on at the stage. Also, there's a proliferation of performance spaces. 
Um, amateur and professional actors are playing fairs, they're playing taverns, um, impromptu performance spaces like barns, meeting rooms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, there's, uh, theater is big business. Uh, and it's a kind of social media that's, that's highly uh, influential at the time. Uh, print comes into this because as soon as a play premiered in one of the London theaters, it would be published. Um, and here's an example of a, a play by Susanna Santleve, a, uh, a, one of our playwrights that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so there was money to be made from print as well as from performance. And plays tended to go from stage to page and back again. We're talking about theaters that recycle plays over and over again. This playbill is for um, another Salt Leaf play, The Wonder, um, which was first performed in the early 18th century. This is a late 18th century performance that was chosen by the famous actor David Garrick as his farewell performance. It was that popular a play. Um, so I'm going to end by just giving a couple of examples here. I, who are these women I'm talking about? Uh, this is um, Susanna Santley. Uh, like many of these women, she was self-educated and entered the theater business as an actress. But she made a much better living by writing plays that had long lives, uh, both on the theater and on the stage. Uh, her play, The Busy Body, for example, which Mr. Anderson has had a hand in bringing to the uh, uh, 21st century stage, um, was performed more than 450 times before 1800 and ran into 40 editions, print editions, before 1884. Uh, Frances Burney is a very different story. Um, Burney wrote a best selling novel. Evelina, or A Young Lady's Entrance into the World, which was published in 1778 and never since out of print. Uh, she followed with three more novels, but she also wrote highly entertaining comedies, one of which was produced by Red Bull this past year. And I know that many of us here uh, had the great pleasure of seeing uh, the production of The Woman Hater uh, that Red Bull gave us. Uh, however, none of her plays, none of her comedies ever made it to the stage during her lifetime. Uh, and the reason they did not was that her male relatives, uh, her father and her uh, um, uh, sort of honorary daddy, uh, Chris, uh, thought the theater was an inappropriate venue uh, for a proper lady uh, like Bernie, uh, essentially shoving her back in the closet, as it were. Um, finally, this is Elizabeth Inchbald, a um, later 18th century playwright. Uh, like St. Leif, uh, Inchbald entered her theatrical career as an actress and indeed uh, worked on the stage for 17 years. She became a highly successful playwright also. And uh, one of my favorite plays of hers, Such Things Are, which manages to critique the British prison system, uh, British colonialism in India, and be very funny at the same time. Uh, that play earned her the sum of over 900 pounds. So, I mean, with that kind of return, with good investment sense, which Innsfold had, uh, she amassed a comfortable income and went on to contribute to the growth of theater criticism with her editing and prefaces to the 25 volume tome, The British Theater. You know, in sum, she moved between the realms of performance, playwriting, and criticism with successes uh, across the board. So I'm just gonna uh, stop with uh, a sort of a question uh, in my head, which I'll throw out there for discussion uh, and looking forward to your questions as well. Uh, how come Santley, Bernie, and Inchbald are not the household names, relatively speaking, that male playwrights such as William Congreve, William Weisherly, or Oliver Goldsmith are? Uh, what happened to these oh-so-popular plays from the 18th century, plays that were on the stage for hundreds of times and um, just sort of disappeared? 
Uh, thank you for listening. And I'm going to hand it over uh, to Liza, who's going to manage our Q&A session. Take it away, Liza. Yeah, I'll actually invite all of our panelists back and I can see you've already appeared. So that's wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to go through the Q, the questions that have been given to us in the Q&A. Um, and if you are in the audience, do feel free to add things to the Q&A as we work through them. Uh, we might run out. So please supply us with all of your burning questions or your cool questions as well. Um, I'll actually start with one in the chat, although from here on out, I will ignore the chat because we would uh, like to keep them in the Q&A. Um, so somebody in the chat asked, uh, in the performance that happens a week from now, um, for which this panel is a preface, um, sort of prefatory thing, um, will you be cutting the play or will we be seeing the whole play that Cavendish wrote? Liza, I'm going to field that one since I'm serving as the dramaturg for our fantastic director, Kim Wilde. Um, it is almost the full play because this is a short play. Um, so we've done some, some minor line editing, uh, but you'll get, to, you'll get to see the play in, in its almost entirety. We're not going to do seven verses, for instance, of some of the songs. Or like the two full folio pages of the list of pleasures, are those staying in? That's what we want to know. Uh, we could not cut any of those. It would be criminal. <laughs> Okay. Um, I also have what is a fairly um, sort of factual question, just as exactly when Cavendish was writing. Um, does anyone want to address that one? I can address that. I mean, you can too, Liza, but she she talks in, in one of her volumes about, uh, about her first volume of plays being lost at sea. <laughs> um, and I think it's a joke. And I, I think that she was writing them both during the interregnum when she started publishing. She started publishing in the early 1650s. Um, and after the restoration, you know, as Misty says, you can sort of see signs of the restoration stuff, particularly in the 1668 volume, right? So the first volume of plays was published in 1662. She intentionally says, I wrote these before but they were, you know, I lost it at sea, so I had to wait around. Um, and then the, the second volume was published in 1668, not coincidentally when they had sort of received word that they would be getting no restitution for their war expenses from the restored monarchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she also talks early in her life about how from a very young age, she was writing all the time, um, but then she burns all her childish books um, because she's embarrassed by her. By her childhood writing. So she starts publishing in the 1650s, according to her own account, she's writing uh, much, much earlier than that. Um, why don't we answer next? Um, uh, do we know any playwrights or other writers that Cavendish admired or was in dialogue with? I mean, she certainly talks about the, you know, the canonical men um, Shakespeare uh, Johnson in particular, uh, she would have she would have seen some of those very early those those very first plays um, uh, written by written by women. But her her sister in law Jane Cavendish also um, wrote a play. So you know, Liza. I mean, I would love to know if if you have if you have more textual evidence as the curator of our digital Cavendish. Yeah, so I will say I've come on very recently to Digital Cavendish. It's really Sean Moore's baby, um, but I have put the link in the chat if you want to explore that amazing resource. Um, but I will say that uh, Cavendish is, uh, I don't know if this is all that widely known, but she's actually the first one to write a critical essay of Shakespeare. So not an essay calling him, you know, not a play calling him an upstart crow critical in that way, but it really sort of an analysis of, of how he writes. And that's in her book, The Sociable Letters, which I don't think we've talked about yet. Um, and then her 1662 plays, which is where I drew a lot of my quotations from, uh, has so much to say about Ben Johnson and in particular Ben Johnson's The Fox, Ben Johnson's Valpone, um, which she really seemed to think of as like a model of what plays were meant to look like that she really disagreed with. So she goes into a lot of detail sort of breaking down what, what puts the fox together, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'll just say two fast things, which is she also knew a lot of um, lesser known playwrights, like she cites the Women's Prize, 
by Fletcher, he's not lesser known, but um, plays by people like Jasper Main, plays that were often about, um, you know, Lysistrata-esque plays. So, you know, she knew she knew a lot of different playwrights of uh, of all kinds of stripes. Mm -hmm. um, maybe next, I'll ask a question from Jason Farr. Um, so Jason says that he loves teaching the Convent of Pleasure in his LGBTQ plus literature classes. Um, can all of us talk a little bit about how we plan to attend to the queer politics or queer possibilities of the convent when we teach it? Um, you know, I would, I, there's, there's so much good scholarship on this. And I think Valerie Trau was in this chat and she was one of the first to, to write about the queer stuff in it. Um, uh, you know, I think it's really fun <laughs> to give some of the texture that we did about, um, you know, women performing cross-dressed roles. So Henrietta Maria performing what would later be called breaches parts and that, there was a huge elaborate sort of thing around platonic love, the sort of cult of platonic love as being sort of both a cover for um, other forms of sexual practice and also an invitation to all kinds. Like there really are all these jokes about, um, not just in the Convent of Pleasure, but in other things that Cavendish wrote about sort of seeing women kissing and it being sort of more than the normal run of things and it also being titillating. Um, and I think she presents, like if you sort of cut, like cut and paste across genres like the blazing world and some of her prose, you see her looking at the, the sort of idea from many, many different angles, um, like the sort of cross-dressing angle, the sort of eroticism of a materialist imagination angle, which I think lies is also really into, might say something about um, the this sort of long, I think she's really interested in Philip Sidney, very interested in Philip Sidney and sort of cross-dressing like that whole plot of the three-headed desire that you see in the Arcadia. I just think she's really creatively engaged with it in all kinds of ways, but I bet Liza has something to say too. And it looks like Christina does too. It's so exciting. Liza, you want to go first? No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just thinking when Julie was talking about the the sort of circumstances of um, these aristocrats who were politically on the out, uh, were politically marginalized, um, and yet still had this sort of, um, you know, lineage of, of claims to power. Um, and I was I was thinking of of like Vita Sackville West and Violet Trefusis a few centuries later, and how there's this sort of odd kind of way in which uh, these ar aristocratic claims to power enable a kind of outsiderness or a kind of queerness in certain circumstances. Um, I am not a Cavendish scholar. I really can't claim to know her work terribly well, though I'm certainly learning a lot. Um, but um, there is definitely something different <laughs> about this woman and the way that she represents the world and how she thinks about it. Um, uh, a kind of uh, really lovely queerness uh, that comes from that. I also think she's playing with um, or working on the different premise, which is sort of the normalcy of same-sex relations and same-sex affection between women. Um, you know, and for those looking to think about these ideas, I still think, I think Laurie Shannon's argument in Sovereign Am Amity is really excellent on this front, like how normative same-sex relations were and that things can exist under uh, the radar or, you know, that marriage was often, and this is my own argument, but marriage was often a sort of an enabling condition for the continuation of same-sex relations. And so our assumption that, you know, might be something that is outside the norm um, is not necessarily the thing. Although I think it makes why that sort of the titillation um, of same-sex women's eroticism as a performance thing for the male gaze really interesting. Yes. Right. 
You can tell we all really like Jason's question. Um, I will just add quickly because we do have others to answer. Um, but so I taught Convent of Pleasure last fall in a seminar called Early Modern Asexuality. Um, so the sort of queerness uh, umbrella very broadly defined. And there's not a sort of asexual character in it, but I taught it as sort of formally asexual, right? Like the comedy is marching towards the marriage at the end and all of these sort of formal disruptions are putting a stop to that. Um, and so thinking about the way the form and the sort of plot are, are working kind of contrary to one another um, is how I've taught it. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I think this might be an interesting one for everyone. Um, somebody asks, uh, oh, now I can't find it. There are too many interesting questions. Um, somebody asked how, uh, besides the sort of difference of plays for performance versus plays for reading, do you find that there are great differences, sort of generally speaking, between women playwrights like Cavendish and men like Shakespeare, Johnson, and so on? You know, I'll take a stab at this uh, because my first book was about the first generation of female playwrights who made a living writing for the stage. And anytime you're writing commercially, um, you're under more generic pressure, right? So what you see and, and what are most successful in that first commercial group, which is Ben Sontlever, uh, Hannah Cowley and Elizabeth Finchbald, um, is something that looks pretty familiar. And so the differences come out in moments uh, where, first of all, you can count women get more lines. Um, it's, it's demonstrably true. Um, they tend to open plays and open scenes more with women talking. Um, and then you'll also get, um, I think, particular beats in the play, not even full scenes where you can feel a kind of pushback um, uh, Callie and the Bell stratagem, um, or, uh, you know, even in a play like The Busybody, which is conventional and very pro-marriage, um, you get, you get female complaint, right? you get women explaining, this is a system that has put me in this box. Um, and they will say that on stage, but then it's enveloped in the conventional. So mm -hmm. Cavendish, of course, you know, delights in her, her closet experiments. And to hit another question, you know, closet drama really just comes from the reference to the closet as, the, as your small personal room, right? Not, not your clothing closet. Um, and that space, of, that space of private reading, which was often a devotional space, especially for Puritans who yes, did outlaw the Maypole in Christmas. And so Cavendish takes great pleasure in putting a Maypole scene in her Arcadian um, pastoral here. You know, lots of lots of things that are also that also have a political tinge that we might miss. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to address that one? Which which part, Liza? The closet part or the? Um, yeah. So we we um, answered the closet one, incidentally, but also whether there are sort of major differences between women playwrights and male playwrights. I think Misty did a great job. Okay. Um, yeah, and as Julie has put in the chats, um, the closet is of course also a transactional space. Um, maybe the question about uh, the portrait. So um, Laura Engel says, this is a question for anyone. I'm interested in the variety of portraits we have of Cavendish, particularly images of her as a statue versus her in the study alone versus her in the group. Um, do you think that she oversaw representations of her image? I can answer that she did. Um, and if so, what do you think she's trying to sort of project or convey with these different engravings? And that will maybe be our last question because I see that we are coming close to time. I mean, I'll just say one thing that I think she's playing with different tropes. You know, she represents herself as a sort of toga wearer. You know, you fight with the sword or you fight with the toga. She represents, as Liza showed, herself in this sort of writing study. Um, you know, she represents herself in that coterie. Um, anybody want to add anything? I will add maybe the one fun fact, which um, uh, a Dutch scholar, um, Leek uh, Deason, told me, which is that the original um, versions, like the sketches of the engraving survive um, in the Netherlands. And in that one where she is at the head of the table with her husband surrounded by her family, in the sketch, her mouth is open. She's in the middle of talking to the entire group. And then when it got uh, made into an engraving for the printed book, her mouth got closed. Um, and I find that a really um, sort of 
poignant and interesting fact, and uh, I'm glad that we're helping her open her mouth again just a week from today. And I'll add, th thanks for bringing up pearls, um, Laura. And as long as the Red Bull doesn't stop us, I'll say, look for some pearls. Um, that's my tease uh, for, the, for the show next Monday. We hope you will all come back. Um, it's going to be a, a real delight. Setting me up as the bad guy just because we have time limits. Um, thank you all so much for this incredible presentation. It has been utterly fascinating. I'm pinned in here be behind my green screen and have been enjoying every second of it. Thank you all for your wonderful questions and watching at home. This is up in perpetuity. I know there's been some emails dropped in chats. I'm sure some of you who weren't able to get your questions answered could definitely send emails to ask them. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm volunteering that um, sans permission, but that's the sense of this community seems to be that that's probably going to be okay. Um, and again, please do check out our reading of this fascinating play um, a week from today. And then on the Thursday following that, there will be a bowl session, which is another talk similar to this at 7.30 with Liza, with Kim, the director, and uh, with myself moderating it and a few of the actors getting a little bit more of how, how do practitioners deal with this text. So if you found this interesting, please do also check that out. Um, Thank you all again so much for coming. This has been a, a wonderful a wonderful seminar. Thank you to our, our panelists, Christina, Julie, Liza, Misty, and everybody, please have a wonderful rest of your Monday night and hopefully see you next week.